Hi everyone and welcome to our second Ask Me Anything video. I'm Shelly with Rock and W Homestead and I teach people how to garden in small spaces and to homestead wherever they live. I'm being joined by Mindy and Christy, so they're going to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Mindy from Our Inspired Roots. I teach people how to homestead for better health. And I'm Christy from StoneFamilyFarmstead.com, and I teach people gardening, food preservation, and homestead organization at the beginner level. Great. Thanks, guys. We are very excited to be here. This is our second video that we've done all around garden pests. A few weeks ago, we gathered a bunch of questions. We asked our readers what their biggest pain points were, and this is our second installment. You had so many questions for us that we decided to split it into two videos. So uh, we're going to go in and for the ease of quickness, we'll answer our questions in a round robin format where each of us reads our question and then answers it. And we're going to get started with Mindy. Okay, the first question today is how to get mealybugs, um, how to get rid of mealybugs organ organically. So um, mealybugs are these tiny little white bugs that look kind of like a fungus and they tend to um, not be as much of a problem outdoors but they are more of a problem in greenhouses and then in indoor plants. So the best way to get rid of them is to actually just spray them with organic um, pest sprays. So one is a soap and water spray you could use. Another is a neem oil spray which I have um, a recipe for that and we can link to that. And then also the hot pepper spray that we talked about in the last video, um, that can work too. And I think that you can even just spray them off with water. Um, and so you have to do it for a few weeks though, just to keep up with it because with any kind of organic pest control, you it's just, it's not going to stay around for a long time. You just have to do it consistently every day and sometimes multiple times throughout the day. Um, and then of course, making sure that your plants are healthy and your soil is healthy is also helpful. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question for all of us to ask. Our reader said that they have too much rain to grow a peach tree. Um, and she says, I'm happy to have solved uh, her white fly caterpillar problem but she wants to know what she should do about all the rain that's coming for her peach trees that she's had a hard time growing them. So, um, Christy, do you have any uh, insight into that? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> it's sort of a losing game to try to keep the rain away. I know that because in California, we've had more rain than we've had in so very long. And um, it's just not, you know, I mean, there's just nothing you can do really. But I do have um, an idea that maybe might help you to uh, be able to grow your peach tree. And um, that would be perhaps to get a dwarf um, variety that grows in your zone and plant it in one of those big um, half barrels. And then put it on somewhere where you can kind of roll it out of the rain or under some, you know, some kind of protection so that you can keep it from getting flooded. And so a lot of people have had success with just growing dwarf trees that way. It's not as much fruit, but it's something. Mindy, you have anything to add? Yeah, trees generally don't like being in a lot of water. So um, choosing a spot, a, a good spot for it on your land is the best um, is the best choice just something that's not too wet but if you can't find if there's like nowhere on your piece of property that is less swampy or just drier then perhaps you need a different variety or you just need to go with a different fruit tree altogether um, because sometimes I mean not everything is gonna grow in every location so yeah and then just like you said to be sure that you're putting it in an area that doesn't have standing water. So whatever you can do to either make it drain faster around there, maybe you need to divert water away from that area, or um, when you're first planting, if you know that you have really wet soil, clay soil, you're gonna put some amendments in there so that the water will drain off faster. Because you're right, if they sit in water for any length of time, the, the roots, 
it'll die. The, the roots will be waterlogged and it will die. So yeah, that's, that's a challenge when we have so much rain. The next one's for me. Uh, our reader says that they have lots of rain causing late blight on non-greenhouse tomatoes. I did some research about that. I haven't had blight on my tomatoes before. It's the same fungus that killed all of the potatoes in the Great Potato Famine of the 1840s, in the 1840s. So it's been around a really, really long time. It's, I didn't realize how big of a deal late blight is. There are actually websites devoted to tracking late blight. And um, one of them is usablight.org, and we'll put these notes in the bottom, in the show notes. They have a blight map that you can look every year and see if it's in your area and people report if they have blight and if it's coming in their way. And so everyone tracks it. The thing about getting blight on your tomatoes and potatoes, it's those two things, is that it will wipe out your entire crop and you don't see it until it's the end of the cycle when you're just about ready to harvest and then it wipes out your, your crops. So it's caused by this fungus. It doesn't overwinter in your soil, so if you had it last year, you don't have to do any treatments to your soil at all, but since it's, uh, it's sent out by spore, so it's airborne, if you have any potato tubers or that you didn't harvest that come up, or if you have any tomatoes that sprouted from seeds from last year, you need to get rid of them if you had blight the year before, because those plants will be infected. And then be sure that you are getting your potato tubers from a reliable source because that's one way it's transferred into your garden. And then check the blight map and see if, because it had like the last 10 years of blight, you can look and see if your area is prone to that. It likes rainy, humid weather. So I live in Texas, that's a reality for our, for our gardens. And so you just need to... Um, be aware of it and then let me tell you about some ways to prevent it so like I said you want to remove any volunteer potatoes or tomatoes that come up and then you might want to consider buying blight resistant seeds or plants they make them it just depends on if you want to grow those kind or if you buy heritage uh, instead you want to leave plenty of space between your plants so that it, they can get airflow so that if it is wet or humid that they that the air doesn't get trapped in there and it, um, that the disease won't grow more because there's not enough airflow. And then you want to water from below, so keep the plants as dry as possible, water the soil and not the plants. And then you need to know how to identify it, and then if you do find it, you have to dispose of it properly. And so in another place, Cornell University has a, a website dedicated to how to recognize it and dispose of it because you don't just put it in your compost and hope it goes away, it, it will infect everything. So, so you really just have to be vigilant about it and um, do what you can so that you don't get it and then get rid of it when you do. I have a question about that. Yes. Do you think that it would be prudent to perhaps um, grow your tomatoes away from your potatoes just in case you get one of them gets blight and then hopefully you could save the other? Yes, I do that anyway because they're in the same family. Mm -hmm. And so I always grow my tomatoes and potatoes differently. And well, they're actually even different seasons, right? Potatoes are cool weather here in Texas and tomatoes are warm weather. So, um, so I would plant my potatoes in the fall when it's cooler and um, they'll be done by the time my tomatoes come in. But I wouldn't plant them in the same spot anyway because they're in the same family. And that's a good point. Yeah. I always plant, uh, I'll like divide them up. Like I'll take potatoes and plant them separately from tomatoes, but I'll also have like two separate places that tomatoes are and two places that mm -hmm. potatoes are because we always got that. So I just tried to at least have a spot that didn't get it, you know, yeah. if everything else did. So, yeah. All um. right. The next question is how to. What is the next question? I talked about mealybugs, right? You have fly worms. Right, okay. So um, fly worms in the currants. So fly worms, I'm assuming they mean um, gooseberry maggot and currant fruit fly. So 
the deal with these is that they you have to interrupt the life cycle to stop them they the flies will lay their eggs into the fruit and then the fruit will often drop off early um, hit the ground and then the pupa go into the ground and overwinter there so you have to break up that life cycle in order to stop them from going through the whole cycle all over again um, one thing that you can do is you can put row covers on your uninfested plants so that they don't get infested um, you don't want to do that on your infested plants because it'll just trap the bugs in there you can put a plastic sheet or a tarp down under your um, fruit so that when the fruit drops it lands there instead of on the ground so you can just scoop all of that fruit up and get rid of it um, so uh, the thing that I would do though is I would actually try putting chickens in there um, gating it off chickens love fruit so it makes sense that they would eat any of the fallen fruit and they would be cleaning all that up and hopefully none of that would get into the ground to overwinter. If you have an infestation like that anyway, it really doesn't matter if your chickens eat all of it, you're, you're not gonna get much fruit to begin with. So that's what I would start with. And then you could also try a kaolin clay spray, which you spray on the fruit and the, the flies, it irritates their body, they don't like that. And that can get rid of them too. And that's it for that one. Okay, so the next question is, um, it's kind of multiple questions. A lot of people asked about this. And um, somebody says, cabbage worms are a real problem in my community garden plot. What's the best way to deter them? Um, also, what is best for caterpillars on cabbage? And then somebody just put cabbage worms and squash borers. Enough said, right? So, um, so I am not sure whether all of these questions are addressing only cabbage worms or if they are also um, addressing cabbage loopers since they can exist simultaneously in the same season on the same plant. So I'll just go ahead and talk to both of those or talk about those, both of those. Um, there's a few things that you can do is upon um, planting your seeds or your transplants, if you know that this is an issue that you have every single year, just uh, do row covers and that will keep the, the moths from landing on the plants and you know laying eggs and you know in turn it'll stop the larva from chewing on your plants because they just won't be there. So um, another thing that you can do is attract, like at the beginning of the season, attract or add beneficials. So attract would be at the beginning of the season, add would be if you have a full-blown infestation. So you can um, get beneficials like green lace wings or ladybugs, praying mantis, spine soldier bugs, trichogramma wasps, I don't know if I'm saying that right, and then beneficial nematodes, all those should be able to help. And if you just have like a crazy infestation and you want to save what you've got, um, you can use neem oil soap or BT on that. Just make sure you wash your vegetables really good. Great. So for the squash borer problem though, you can apply beneficial nematodes for long-term control and use floating row covers to prevent the moths from laying eggs like I was talking about before. And you might try a garlic spray. Um, I have not done that before, but I think the spray that Mindy mentioned or Shelly uh, in the last video, um, we're going to link you guys to that in the show notes, but um, that should be helpful as well. Okay. Yeah, it was in grasshoppers. We talked about it first at grasshoppers. Okay. Yeah. Um, next, we had a question about slugs eating strawberries, and slugs will eat anything they can get, right? Um, so we have to constantly combat them. It seems like there's always something to combat in the garden, right? So first of all, you need to remove any hiding places that they might be found. That's like having boards in your garden or stones or any debris. If you have tall grass around your tree trunks, or leafy branches close to the ground, they'll, they'll hide in any of those places. If you're gonna go looking for them, that's a good place to find them during the day. And then if you have any dense ground covers like ivy, or if you have straw that's always wet as mulch, they might be hiding under that. So you wanna just go look and see if you can find where they're living. The thing about slugs is, 
you pretty much just have to go remove them by hand to get up to get a control of it all because they'll they'll just keep coming right so you have to you have to go in at night and you have to do your due diligence and you have to get them out of there and then most people say that once they've done that a few nights or even for a week then they're they're less they they're less of them in your garden um, you want to probably set a trap for them with stale beer in a some kind of a container that you can bury in the ground at ground level and put stale beer in there I've also heard that you can use jam mixed with water in there and they like that too what happens is they they go in that container and then they can't get out and so they die and in the morning you just toss them in the trash or whatever you're gonna do with them feed them to your chickens they'll probably like them um, and then you you also probably want to encourage some natural predators coming into your garden things that eat them so birds will eat them frogs toads and small snakes so if you if you have any of those beneficial predators in your garden those will also they'll also get rid of them and then one thing that you don't want to use are those slug pellets that they make they, they come organically but the thing about those is they'll they'll also kill all of the allies that you have in your garden. And, and so you're gonna lose the beneficials as you're losing the slugs. So you, you don't wanna go that way. Um, I can't think of a reason I would use it really because you don't wanna hurt the beneficials that are, are there. So pick them as much as you can, remove their hiding places, and then encourage natural predators. I think Mindy's next. Okay. <clears throat> The next one is Drosophila in the blackberries. This is fruit flies. Um, fruit flies are pretty easy to get rid of. Um, you can make a vinegar trap. So you can take uh, like some sort of a little bucket, poke some holes in it in the top so that the fruit flies can go in, put some vinegar. I like to use apple cider vinegar, vinegar because it has more of the like fruity kind of smell to it. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to attract them better than other kinds, but I think you can use other kind of vinegar too. So you put the vinegar in there, <clears throat> a little bit of dish soap, biodegradable dish soap, and then you wanna hang it near whatever plants are being affected by the fruit flies. Um, you can also use a neem spray and you can probably use other sprays like the soap and water spray and the pepper spray too. But definitely the, the vinegar trap is a really good way to get a lot of them. And then you could use a neem spray or something like that to get the residual ones. Can you share why you would put the biodegradable dish soap? It just makes it so that the bugs don't sit on the top of the vinegar. They kind of, what is it? Um, it like breaks the thing. Yeah, surface tension. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, Christy, I think you're next. Okay. So um, this is also a, like a multiple question question. And it's dealing with small black ants and um, aphids in the greenhouse. And then somebody that talked about um, having a lot of small black ants in their raised beds and you know, they wanted some sunflowers in their garden, but the, the, there was a massive aphid farming in there. So um, basically, uh, ants and aphids tend to go hand in hand, and that's just pretty much the way it is. For aphids, um, you can use yellow sticky traps as a line of prevention, but if you already have an infestation, you're gonna to wanna to try uh, either bringing in some ladybugs or lace wings if you wanna do it that way. Um, but before you do that, it might be more economical just to go through whatever the plant is and just with a, a strong, steady stream from your hose, just try to hose all the aphids off of there and just knock them off of your plant and check on the undersides of leaves if it's, you know, that kind of thing. I know right now I have kale in the garden and it is um, it is bolting. So up at the top is where I see all, the, all of the aphids, but they're not always that visible. So you're gonna wanna look on the undersides of leaves and things like that and just all around. You'll get the hang of where they hang out on each kind of plant. But um, that's really a good 
you know, cheap way to deal with it. Um, aphid control is a really long game because they multiply so quickly that you may find more aphids on your plant the next day after you've spent a bunch of time, you know, knocking them off of your plant. So you probably have to do that probably for about two weeks. And for giant infested like leaves, like uh, pumpkin or squash or something like that, I just remove that whole leaf and just throw it away because, you know, there's no use um, saving a leaf that's, you know, just been completely um, eaten up by aphids. So there's that. But you just want to make sure that you do it every single day for about two weeks because they're just fast. Um, you can use um, a warm soapy water spray, but again, you know, to me that's really tedious that, that I have to go and keep refilling with warm water and soap, you know, so I just like to use the hose. Um, I also do a thing where I crush them with my hands, you know, if there's just kind of a little bit on a leaf, I'll just, you know, with my thumb, I know that's really gross, but whatever, you know, it's, I'm a gardener, you know, y'all are too, and you know, it doesn't hurt anything to do that. Um, as um, a last resort, you can actually use something like BT if you want to, um, or some other, um, some other spray that'll work. I'm pretty sure that the Dr. Earth's spray the one that comes in the yellow um, bottle that is has a essential oil base I think that will work as well and um, so anyway so with the ants though um, they're often protecting that aphid colony so they have this symbiotic relationship where the the ants are protecting this colony and this colony of aphids is feeding the ants as they're eating your plant up so um, you have to deal with both of them and they're sometimes a little bit different in in your approach but you can try a diatomaceous earth sprinkled all around the base of your plant and even on the leaves and stuff but mostly what you're going to find there are aphids and it just really works fine just to use the hose you know a, st a strong steady spray of the hose and so basically that's what i would do and then if I'm working on it for more than two weeks or whatever, sometimes I'll just remove the whole plant or, you know, if you wanted to, you could, you could go at it with um, some kind of OMRI approved um, organic spray or something like that. Do you think if you, would it be bad to compost those leaves? Would the aphids live in your compost bin? What do you think? Um, I don't know. I have heard not to ever compost anything that has a pest or a disease issue. Um, but you know what? I have, and I don't really find any big issue with things. I actually not really have composted, but I've like removed whole plants and just kind of left them sitting in my garden. And I really have never had an issue like that. I mean, the, the official word is you better remove it right away so it doesn't infest anything else. But, you know, you figure out in whatever climate you are in what you can do. And I can actually leave the plants just on the ground and it doesn't really do too much. But you know what? Your mileage may vary with that. It's not really that kind of um, advice that you give out. <laughs> yeah, and maybe aphids are different than when we were talking about that fungus. Mm -hmm. um, that's so contagious that might that might be different if because if you didn't have the leaves compost all the way you'd be transferring it for sure right mm -hmm. right so. and if also and if you're not composting you know to where it gets like super hot you know yeah um, you may not kill whatever you know and yeah that's what I was thinking is that if you if you were sure that you composted it at a high temperature and did that whole thing then technically there would be nothing, nothing could live, I, I think. But like you said, you, you know, it's hard, it's hard to know really. Right. I tend to be a lazy composter. So I probably should go on the safe side and yeah. not do it at all. Yeah, I think so. Okay. We have one final question. Um, it, it was, does vinegar do anything to the soil makeup and affect the taste of the fruits or vegetables? And um, vinegar does change your soil pH, um, but not the taste of your, of your food. So if you live in a place that has, tends to have alkaline soil like I do in Texas, 
you and you want to grow blueberries, which like to have acidic soil, you can add um, you can add vinegar to your water as you're watering them. It would just be one or two teaspoons of vinegar per gallon of water, and that would give that one plant this acidity that it needed. Um, so it would be healthier. Um, but it it will increase the pH level, but it take of your soil, but it takes quite a while. So if you're just you wouldn't want to blanket your whole garden with it, it wouldn't be effective. But if you have specific plants that need to have the pH change, you could do it with vinegar. Use five percent vinegar, not the twenty percent horticulture vinegar, and then you would be able to do it. There are other ways. I don't know if I, I didn't write it down. There are other ways to change the pH of your soil if you're gonna if you're trying to do your whole garden. And, but vinegar is not the way to do it. So it would be on a plant by plant basis. And those are the only, those are the last of the questions we have. Do you guys have anything you want to add? No? Okay. No, then thank you for joining us. We are so happy that you've, that you've been here. Um, we hope you've been able to get some solutions for some of your biggest garden pest issues. Uh, we will, put our websites and products that we mentioned and any other links in the show notes and also our social media channels. We'd love to have you join us and come in the conversation that we're having on those. So we will see you next time.